Good. All right. Questions at this point? Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm wondering if I should say this. Oh, why not? we got five minutes left, and I'll just say no. We won't answer. Yeah. Hey, you ought to come this, to the morning class, and <laughs> they'll answer that question for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to bring up sanctification. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, time has come for judging the dead and rewarding your servants and prophets mm -hmm. and your saints. Yes. It's, it's a vindication of the whole idea of sanctification, that 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 there is a that there is a process that we go through. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we're here tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think of it as sanctification. I think of it as improving myself. Even though I'm doing it, I'm doing it through the power of the Lord, and I'm, I'm already approved. Mm -hmm. I can still improve through the process of sanctification towards um, what they're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Now, that, that's either correct or it's my Catholic upbringing. Um, <laughs> it's on your head again. There's a lot of, I, I mean, I, I will say because I know I'm ordained now and so I should have had this one figured out a while ago, uh, but I've gone back and forth on this, this issue a great deal. Here's how I, I've come to think of sanctification. Justification is God declaring you righteous. Sanctification is God declaring your works righteous. So it's still God's gracious work. And what's more, see, I don't think we can stop there with sanctification because sanctification also speaks of, uh, oh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But the flip side of that is because you're in me, you will do something. So Ephesians 2, our great justification passage, by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, created to do the works he's given you beforehand. So, I mean, even there, before we get too excited about how much we're doing, you're recreated, you're resurrected in a sense, and God has works that he's prepared for you to do. Um, and so there is a sense in which we're now put right with God and we live right towards the world. But does that make us holier or more sanctified? Yeah, not holier. No. Not holier. I, I would never say holier. And I don't think I would ever say more sanctified. I, th I think I would say, well, I, I actually think sanctification is more of a dying than it is an improving. That is to say, the old sinful nature is dying more now and the new life is resurrecting more as opposed to now I'm finally climbing, climbing, climbing Jacob's ladder, ladder, ladder. Okay, Paul talks about, um, about knowledge. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and that if we have this knowledge, um, do we then use it to go out and sin more because we now know that we're forgiven of our sins? Right. When he, when he refers to that type of knowledge, isn't he referring to um, a process that the people around him are going through Hmm. As, as they hear him, as they share with each other, as they grow in their faith. Hmm. Is, that, is that not the process he's, he's referring to? Process is a tricky word. How, pol how political can I sound? Can I, can I sound like a politician? Well, process is an interesting way of saying it. Um, I, I'm not a fan of process, though I am a fan of... Well, that's not a right way of saying it, but I, I like... Uh, uh, Paul's language of, and Hebrew's language of running the race. Uh, I've run the race. I've, you know, been found kind of faithful at the end, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, but the process. Here's here's where I worry about process language because process language very quickly lends to where are you in the process. How far along are you in this? Are you further than that guy who's clearly not very far in the process because he's not doing what you're doing? And that, and that makes me nervous. Yet at the same time, there is a sense in which we die to ourselves more every day and, become, and our minds are more renewed by the working of the Word of God. So I'm even going to say that sanctification happens to us more than we do it. Growing in our holiness happens to us more than something we're doing. Okay, that's that's fine, except that there, 
that in this room right now, mm -hmm. there are many levels of understanding about the, about yeah, the but, scripture. Yeah, uh but, -huh, okay. uh -huh. And at, I come to these these types of events, maybe events a bad word for it, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, just like process probably wasn't the best word for it. But anyway, I, I, like come, I, come, I come to a class like this because I feel the Lord saying, go there, hear this, learn. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and to me, that process... Uh, here's, oh, here's what I would say. What adjective you want to use in, in there? Here's, here's what I would say to that. I would say, yes, that is sanctification. But it's, be, it's, it's not part of a process of sanctifying you, but because Jesus has sanctified you, you are now growing in the Word of God. You are, you are being sanctified by the Word of God, prompting you to do new things. Your, your, your heart has um, new promptings by the Holy Spirit, something like that. Okay. But it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean when you're saved, this is what I want to avoid. When you're saved, you're at this level of sanctification. And by the last day, you're at this level of sanctification. Yeah, and see, see I've, I've gone around and around with my brother about grace. Yeah. Like this, you know, like, it's like in a beaker or something, you know, you get so much grace. Yeah. No, 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 there's no beaker. Right, you know, right. There's no such thing. Sanctif I would say sanctification is the same way. Yeah. Um, because we're saved already. Yeah. And, and I would suggest that sanctification, and the, the Christian life, Luther says once, the Christian life is lived entirely outside of myself. Well, that is in faith towards God and love towards the neighbor. So sanctification is really not so much me serving myself and my spiritual capacities or whatever, but learning to be more outside of myself, to listen to God more and see my hurting neighbor more, something like that. Um, and the word of God is what drives you to that, the renewing of the mind that takes place. Even that stuff in, in Romans 2 um, that talks about the renewing of our mind is still saying it's happening to you because of the word being done to you. Um, and not something that you're doing in order to become more holy. Correct, correct, because holiness is gifted. Um, and so you are holy. So Ferdy says, Ger Gerhard Ferdy, and this is, this is the quote I wrestle with every day of my life. Uh, sanctification is just the is just getting it, well what's it Dave I've told you before sanctification is getting used to being justified getting used to being justified and I love that definition and just recently I read someone who's just ripped that thing to pieces and I thought oh. but there's something to it because when we're being when we're justified we have a hard time believing it we I mean we fight against it tooth and nail saying but I still must do something right and sanctification is just the process of you, if you will, um, of you learning to say, oh no, God means it. I'm really his for free. It's really been done. I am washed in the blood. It is finished for me, so to speak. Um, so, yeah. so, yeah, so, um, are we being sanctified? Coming, I, would, I think if I have to be so very specific with my language, I would say, when you are, you're sanct, as people who are sanctified, when you come to Bible study, you are growing in your knowledge of the Word of God. It is, it is part of what happens when you're sanctified. Okay, you win. The, the sanctification <laughs> process involves having your mind renewed by the Word of God. It's the, but it's the Spirit processing you. It's the Spirit doing to you, not you doing. And, and someone said, well, it's me and the Holy Spirit. Oh. Okay, I'm sure you drove here, but and the Holy Spirit wasn't on the driver's seat or something. But it's the Spirit who's bringing His Word to you, right, and, and doing that work in you. And see, see, in, for the first 21 years of my life, uh -huh. um, the Roman Catholic Church taught me that sanctification was something that you did to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to get better with God. And in fact, what what's dangerous now is in the Wesleyan traditions, Methodism, etc. Uh, uh, is is they say there's something called uh, or this was Charles Finney, immediate sanctification, progressive justification. In other words, we say the opposite: immediate justification, said and done. Progressive sanctification, you you grow in your holiness, something like you grow into being who you are, something like this. But what they would say, what Finney used to say, was once you're saved, 
There's no more drinking. There's no more dancing. There's no none of it. All the swearing and smoking is gone, and you're made new. And if you're not, you're you don't have the Holy Spirit. And you'd better fight against those things to make sure on the last day you're justified. Uh, and we would say, you know, boy, howdy, how Francis Chan gets close. It was so easy. Um, sorry, Cecily. Uh, he just he just walks that line. Um, but what we're gonna say is. You are in, baptized, done. Now, what does the Great Commission say? Um, ba- you, you, uh, make disciples, baptizing them and Jeez. teaching them to obey everything I commanded you because as Luther says so, so marvelously, uh, when you were baptized, the old sinful nature was drowned, but that sucker can swim. Uh, and so you're learning kind of to uh, drown, return to your baptism daily. Daily die to yourself. You're learning to pray. You're learning the Ten Commandments. You're learning the creeds, what to believe. It's a complete renewal of your mind, but our minds and our, well, our body, everything, we are so scarred by original sin that the, the sanctification process is more of a battle with sin, death, in the more of a battle with sin, the old world, and the devil than it is... Uh, like a holification process or something like this, where I just continue to get more and more spiritual. It's a battle more than it is a improvement. Go ahead, Cecily. I'm just saying I don't see it all as growing holier in my life because the more I learn stuff in the Bible, the more I can <laughs> Yeah, right. And I keep disappointing God well, this in is, so many ways. Well, this is really, this is really um, what baffles me about the holiness movement is when people start saying things like, Oh, I just, you know, I'm not even tempted by those things anymore. Oh, well, good for you, but have you read the other nine commandments? <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of work to do. And, and that Luther's got a great line where he says the, the, the commandment on coveting. He says, the, the reason uh, God includes this one uh, is for, is for the, the proud person who says, well, I got through those first nine, okay. <laughs> what, what now? And, and the coveting says, yeah, none of us get out of this thing clean. Um, and in fact, the, I think it's very insightful, Cecily, because the more you grow in your sanctification and, and know the word of God, the more the law becomes convicting. Guiding, yes, because you're empowered by the spirit, but convicting in that goodness, gracious. And this is why the, the lifeblood and uh, the, the diet and the need of the Christian is the gospel. Be, we, we must be gone with this idea that, okay, we've got the gospel, but now what? No, there is no now what. That's the oxygen we breathe. When you're born, you don't say, well, I got the oxygen in. What next? No, no, the gospel is the air we breathe. So in a sense, there is both this declared righteous, and yet there is, and, and not in the beaker sort of way, but grace continually comes to us and continually strengthens us. And it's just the way God speaks with us because what we say is we are living in um, simultaneously sinners and saints. So, and that you, you want to hold on to that thing because otherwise you say what Finney, you hear this idea that, well, if I'm, if I'm saved, I shouldn't be sinning anymore. I should be done with that by now. Right. And no, that's not it at all. Um, Cecily says is right. Is that, the sinfulness just becomes more apparent and the need to come to confession becomes real. Um, Consider those who are unsaved, they're not convicted. They don't even know yeah, right. that they're doing wrong. The people who will come to you and say, I, I just, I, I'm looking at my life right now and I am terrified that I have committed the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You can confidently say to that person, there's not a chance because you are convicted of doing something like the spirit's working in your heart. Um, now repent and believe the good news. Christ is here for you. Unbelievers all over are just rationalizing their sinful. Yeah, right, right. Instead of being convicted. And so, so Luther can say rightly, sorry. That view changes. Yes. Luther can say rightly, um, The life of the Christian is one of, of repentance, um, and that's I think that's fair. Um, so good. So um, yeah, uh, the, the the life of the Christian is the battle against sin. That's sanctification. Go ahead, Art. I mean, I, I kind of feel like through 
His spirit, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. joins our spirit, which is actually trapped in a human body. No. And I'm going to say why, why not to that. Uh, because uh, you are your body and your spirit and your soul, if you want to make it I into I think my a spirit is one thing and my body is another, period. And when you die, our spirit rises. And then Christ puts it back together at the resurrection yeah. with your body. Maybe. So, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what no chance. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what we want to, so that's fine to say that, but that, but we're not going to say this, that the Holy Spirit unites with my spirit, but my body's sort of inconsequential in all of this. No, the Holy Spirit unites to you, body and spirit, because you're not, we can't kind of piece parts ourselves. Yeah, this body is sinful. All and so is your spirit. Your body and your spirit are sinful. I, believe, I don't think our spirit was sinful before it was placed in the body. That is, um, our spirit was placed in our mother's womb. Uh, no. To make a body. No. To make a human. No. Man. That's not right. That's what's Mormonism, actually. That's actually yeah, what the Mormons teach. Yeah. Before I, I yeah. Created yeah. Before I created you in the womb. So there's no you before the womb. That's where God created you in the womb. But he knows you, because he's outside of time and all of that. Right. Delightful stuff. Easy. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but there's no you apart from your body. You are you. Body and spirit. Makeup art. Um, and this body is not a cage in which we live that we want must, one day must escape. Uh, but in fact, this body is a good part of the creation that, along with our spirit, has been corrupted by the fall. Um, and so our body and spirit together are sinful and both need to be renewed. Otherwise, otherwise this is what's, what happens, Art, is we say, well, Jesus died for uh, one part of me, but not for me, all of me. No, no, he died for you, body and spirit. Yeah, this that distinction... approaches Gnosticism. It is Gnosticism. It's, it's the, uh, disregard for the body, but the spirit is good. Yeah, body, bad, spirit, good. No, no, the whole thing is fallen. Yeah. The whole thing is in there. Go ahead, Cecil. I was just going to say, if the body isn't important, then we wouldn't be resurrected. Yeah, that's right. The re th that's, that is 100% right now. Well, sorry, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> the, that's right. Uh, because the, re the point of the gospel is not to go to heaven when we die, but to rise again at the resurrection of the dead, to live in a renewed body, resurrected body, uh, that will neither die nor suffer nor feel pain or any of that kind of stuff. Or if it does feel pain, it will be, um, I don't know, in a good way, right? You scrape your knee, kind of fun. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, um, it's not going to be like a, a terrible thing. So our bodies will be renewed. Yeah, keep using the, the word renewed. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so. I told you guys this story, right, where I, on my uh, vicarage, I spoke at a retirement home and uh, to a bunch of ladies who are probably all over the age of 85, and I said to them, oh, what good news, we get our bodies back. And they all said, that's not good news at all. <laughs> and I learned I needed to think about how I spoke of the resurrection. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Art. Yeah. What about people that expect, you know, amputees? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, and, and I asked that question at seminary once with my professor. I said, what about my um, appendix scar? Is it going to be there when I rise? And he said... It's an interesting question because Jesus still has the wounds in his hands, uh, but if it's if that stuff remains, if that stuff remains, then we look back on it and see it from God's perspective and say, "How glorious!" But otherwise, we look back on it and we say, I, "My legs are back." I don't know. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be good. There's nothing to fear there. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be good. Yes, Cecily. Well, doesn't that come in? I, I think he will. What, how would I'm that? I'm just saying, as far as amputees. Oh, that's a great. You know, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you rise again, sure. Yeah, maybe so. That makes a lot of sense. I, that's the best. Art. Boy, Cecily, now the star up writer. That's a very good answer. No. Um, no. Look, I mean, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, yeah, that's a great because Jesus his holes remain for a purpose because he ever lives to intercede for us, right? Um, so yeah, I know. I'll take that. That's that's pretty interesting. But we don't know. But we don't know. Yeah, we don't know because I mean, what, what about people with MS? What about people that have other diseases that hmm. throughout their whole life? Or, 
yeah, right. Are they somehow um, less than human because of that? Well, no, of course not, right? And so, well, God, when we get to heaven, what about them? Whatever it is, it's going to be great. God will do what's best with it. And, and we will just be amazed. And they will too. Uh, I, I mean, I, I want us to make sure we understand that whatever it is, it's going to be good. It's going to be very good. Um, Wasn't part of this journey to uh, realize what God had created us to be in the first place? Yes. The, the only He's living the animal or the clay. Right. Right, because he had a, he was humanity was made special apart from and, and matters in a way that's different. So he breathes his spirit into he breathes into them as opposed to just builds them. Yeah, yeah. Jesus made the uh, uh, the lame walk and the blind to see. So sure, very good. That yeah, be, that's great. I'll take you. Okay, you're winning over there. Good job, <laughs> family. Well, I'm gonna get the, the oh yeah, and remember, remember this how he does it too at certain points, right? With the blind, what does he do? He spits on the ground. Right. Well, that's just gross. Uh, but you're seeing here the recreative work of Christ, and he's using means of the earth to do his job. I feel more sanctified just speaking this question. Yeah, you should. The light emanating around you. And Kevin before, Dave. You know, there's a little. This corner is a very strange shadow in the middle of it. But otherwise, that's very good. Yeah. yeah. So for next week, we're going to sell indulgences to sit over there. Yeah. All right. Anything else tonight, you guys? Okay, good. Good questions. Yeah, that's a our, that's a really good thing to bring up because it is just it's it's the common way people view it. That and then someone some people will say, well, look, your body's sinful, your spirit's sinful, but your or your body and your soul are sinful, but your spirit is good, and they'll they'll piece parts this thing up. But the the New Testament just doesn't talk that way. The whole thing is fallen, and the whole thing needs to be saved. Otherwise, and this is what happens. Otherwise, what gets into this is the, uh, and this goes too far, but the theology of the free will which says my spirit and my soul and my body have fallen, but my spirit can still decide to follow Christ. And the Bible says, no, you're dead. Dead in your sins and trespasses. And Christ raises you to a new life. Um, so that's, that's the... Will, yeah. There is no free will then uh, before Christ. Um, and so this is... That's where that goes. Um, so we can close with the song, All of Me, Why Not Take All of Me? Yeah, I think that's good. Yes, that's good. Yes, yes. So I wonder... <laughs> You know, like we're the only species on Earth. What what makes us different from all the other animals, mammals on Earth is the ability mentally that we are, we're aware. We can make choices and be aware of what's going on in our future. Period. No, and I would say I think biblically the way you would say it, what makes us different from all the other creatures in the world is God has set us apart specifically as the chief part of His creation to care for everything else. It's our responsibility and our ability, obviously, to think. And be, but because we're created in the image of God, that's what sets us apart, not just our reason. Because monkeys can do some reasonable things. Um, well, I'm, I'm talking about the awareness of from right and wrong, just a natural. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, that being said, we have instincts and like. Um, I, I can teach my dog right and wrong. Yeah. Well, and morning lights that go off, you know, like. You'll feel it before you even see it. You can feel a presence before you even see it that puts you on a defensive reaction. Sure, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, but I mean. That's got to oh. be more than just a physical ability. That's got to be a spiritually. I, I, something more than just a physical I don't know, yeah. I, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out. Okay. Um, okay. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Okay, go for it. Proof text me. Oh, I'll come down. Well, mine's different than his, but mm -hmm. mine says, from the first, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before mm -hmm. you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Uh-huh. That's great. So, uh, so why are we reading that verse? Because we had a conversation last week about sanctification. So who, so who did the sanctifying in this text? 
Well, before the womb, I'm assuming that God, God. sanctified him already? Good answer. Yes. Now, just to be clear, here, here when we're talking about sanctification, this gets a little complicated because here sanctifying is referring to God setting apart Jeremiah for a particular right. task. And that's how the idea sure. translates. Yeah, it. and so that's that is not full of what consecrating is, is a good translation as well. Um, I, I think that that is a part of, but not the whole of, what we mean by sanctification when we use it as a technical theological term. Um, so that's part of it, but not all of it. Okay, because I mean, you could, you, I mean, this is talking about Jeremiah being set apart for a very specific, particular task in the life of Israel, and God choosing Jeremiah for that. I have set you apart. I have holified you. Um, I bet I bet the Hebrew there is the word for made holy, um, but not in terms of sort of a spiritual inner holiness, but more of a set apart like one of the holy things. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And what we said, what we were saying last week, mm-hmm. talking about a process, you said you didn't like the word process. Yeah. Then you decided the process probably wasn't so bad. Depends on how we use it, but yeah. go ahead. Uh huh. <clears throat> That wasn't the process. That was in the womb. Yeah, right. This is something God did. All God did to him. And yeah. It's done. It's done deal by the time the guy's born. That yeah, has but to do with what we were talking about in terms of of, of a person progressing or. or yeah, uh, this is this is not a verse to teach us about the doctrine of sanctification in the life of every Christian. This is a very specific verse given to a very specific person dealing right. with a very specific mission. So, so what did we conclude on that though? We didn't. We left. Um, <laughs> Does anybody want to do research for the next week? Or not? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of discussion as what does it mean to be sanctified? Um, and I, I mean, if you give me five minutes, I can go run and grab some, some helpful material. Um, but I think, I think what we would say is sanctification is that is that I just I'm so hesitant with this word and I'll tell you why I'm hesitant with it but it's the process in the life of the believer of fighting off the old sinful nature and I would say that's how I would define sanctification and by and I say pro, I'm hesitant with process because Dave and I were talking about this the other day in terms of how do we talk about discipleship here at faith and I'm very hesitant to use this process language because process sounds like you get to a certain level and then you graduate to the next level and, and Dave was talking about it like a baseball diamond like you are sort of on a first base second base third base home run sanctified kind of thing as if you can actually arrive first the problem there is as if you can actually arrive at being fully sanctified on this side of heaven which you cannot um, and the other problem with that is is it leads to a rather self-righteous view of the Christian life. Well, I'm a second baser and you're still a first baser, something like this. And that's certainly not what you see in the New Testament. Uh, I would say, but process is appropriate if we're saying, as as I'm living the Christian life as a baptized child of God, as I grow, I start to see sin more clearly in my life. I start to see what I need to repent of more. Um, and, And that sort of stuff does come along it doesn't happen immediately it's something we grow into but it's it's a growth process i suppose would be a good way of talking about it tom go ahead and, and that was my that was the center of my question yeah because there's a process there uh-huh and, you know, it's not, we can call it something besides sanctification okay yeah but there still is a process there yeah that was the tenor of the question was that there's there's something going on there that um creates in us um a more pure heart, um, you know, a better ability to do God's will. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think I want to say, I think I want to kind of talk this way about it. Justification, you, you, it's always good to play them off each other. Justification is God for you, God to you. Uh, sanctification is God through you. We don't do anything on justification. No, and even even in sanctification, 
God gets all the glory because it's him at work in us and through us. So, so the, it, it's, it's all just prepositions, right? I mean, uh, for you, to you is justification. In you and through you is sanctification. And what separates us from, say, Rome, the Catholic Church, is that they're going to say, no, justification is the in and through stuff. Um, and you're only saved if the Spirit... And, and so what happens then is you're looking for your assurance and salvation in your lo- inside and in your actions as opposed to to the word which was done for you and to you outside of you. Does that make sense? But that outside of you stuff is n- does not grant you, as I saw one guy say the other day, on uh, one of my professors from seminary wrote, uh, justification does not grant you an impotent Holy Spirit. He's actually working and he's actually powerful and he's actually doing stuff through you. But the danger we're going to run into is to say um, that I can somehow gauge it or see it, even then it's still hidden from my sight. And it's still the work of the Spirit, whether I see it or not. So that on the last day, the Spirit can say something, God can say something like, well done, good and faithful servant. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And we can respond with, well, when was that? I don't, I didn't see that. When I was thirsty, you gave me, oh, well, where, you were thirsty. Where were you? Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So in other words, Luther will say it this way. uh, Faith says, uh, before faith can ask what good works can be done, they're already being done. Because God is looking and saying, what you're doing is good in my sight. Because it's my spirit working through you. Does that make sense? Okay. Isn't that the sanctifying? He, He makes holy what we do. Yes. In response to his love for us. Yes, that's right. Um... Yeah, uh, the good works done in the Christian life are sanctified, we might say, um, because they're done by one who is justified. I, I like that. I think that's helpful. If I recall correctly, I think you did a sermon on all this. I'm, I've and, probably done... And a third term you included with those other two were propitiation. Mm. No, propitiation is uh, part of justification. But you were, there was something we were talking about, and you were using those three terms. Oh, boy. That word came up several times, didn't it? If that was a sermon I preached, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I've really tried to, uh, so, if I do a big word, I try and at least keep Actually, it down to one in a sermon. A <laughs> so, propitiation I'm is... I way think that understanding better than I have before. I mean, I, I, I wonder if we could say it this way. Propitiation is the transfer of... Kind of, yeah. So there's a, there's an order to these things, and you want to get them right. So propitiation is the basis of justification. That is to say, I am right with God because Jesus died in my place. Propitiation means Jesus stands in the way of God's wrath. He turns the wrath away from you onto Himself. That is propitiation. Okay. In return, we get His righteousness. And yeah, that's right. And then Luther has this great exchange description where he says he gets our sin. Uh, and we get his righteousness, this great exchange, okay? And so, uh, but propitiation, technically speaking, is simply God's wrath hitting Jesus and not you. He gets in the way. And on that basis, you're declared righteous. You're justified because Jesus has done this for you, okay? Justification is propitiation for you. And because of that, you have been raised to a new life in Christ, united with him in his resurrection, uh, so that the Spirit works through you, and that working through you is the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Yet it's all grace. And that's, and, and that's where you want to go. That even sanctification is grace, is God's stuff for me, through me. Okay, good. Yes, Kevin. <laughs> Um, well, on this, um, let's see, the spirit going in you and through you. Uh-huh. Now, do you say that is because in your readout for <laughs> take it with you? you okay, what's you, okay? What, what, is that Sundays? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, Martin Luther, a quote about the spirit that is with you, um, but before you can have the spirit apart from and before contact with the word. But. Whoa, whoa, that's what that quote says? 
It says, in these matters which concern the spoken external word, uh -huh. it must be firmly maintained that God gives no one his spirit or grace apart from the external word which goes before. Yes, that's good. We say this to protect ourselves from the enthusiasts, that is, the spirits who boast that they have the spirit apart from and before contact with the word. Right, so the enthusiasts are bad guys. No, what? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, so in that quote. If... In, in Acts 2, and it says, And it shall come to pass on the last days that I will pour out of my Spirit mm -hmm. on all flesh. Mm -hmm. So if that's on all flesh, that is going to be people that are not maybe in the Word or familiar with the Word. Right? No? Uh, go to, what text? Are you, where is the text? Acts, Acts what? Two. Okay. Acts 2. Okay. Acts 2 what? Sorry. Jeremiah. Or Acts 2, and it's uh, uh, Joel. <laughs> And I pour my spirit on, on all on all flesh, and what will they do? Prophesy. Now, this is very significant. That the spirit and the word are not separated here, but in fact intertwined with one another. Okay. Um, and so the idea here is um, is this: the Holy Spirit comes to the church through the apostles, and the apostles are then found doing what? Apostles. Preaching the word, delivering the word. And the Spirit then gets uses that word to deliver salvation and do his work. But the Spirit is always bound to the word. And you might say, well, here it looks like the Spirit's working apart from the word. Well, no, because this is the Spirit that was promised by Jesus to these people. So the Spirit came just as Jesus had said with his word. But if it's, if it's saying on all flesh, how can it be guaranteed that it's going to be on all your sons and daughters that are going to take up the word? I'm, so does that make sense? I'm not, I'm not quite... Well, are, are, you asking, are you asking whether or not this is saying uh, everybody is going to be right. saved or not? No, not saved. But everyone will receive everyone the Holy Spirit. Have the Holy Spirit in them. So I see. No, I think here... Um, all flesh is not referring to boy that's a tough question um go ahead marjorie if you read the next sentence on that thing it says um we say this to protect ourselves from the enthusiasts that is the spirits who boast and say that they have the spirit apart from and before contact with the word on this basis they judge, interpret, and twist the scripture or oral word according to their pleasure. So I read this to mean that just because they have that poured out on them doesn't mean that they are a believer and that they aren't above using it the way that it, it says here, to twist and interpret the, the scriptures to their own... Even though it's God's spirit? Yeah, this is, this is, a, I, this is a good... This is a good question yeah because um what the text sounds like it's saying is now you got to think of the context here i think by all flesh here it does not mean every single person will receive the holy spirit but all flesh is referring to a sort of our revelation language peoples from every nation language tribe and tongue now why would i say that because it's in the context of pentecost where a chapter Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. Um, it, it, the Spirit comes to the apostles. The apostles preach, and it's given to uh, Jews from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. Then they take it, and they go out, and they preach it to all nations. And so all the nations are going to start receiving the word because are going to start receiving the Spirit because the Word goes with them. And so what you'll notice then throughout the book of Acts is uh, that the Holy Spirit starts showing up where these people from the day of Pentecost are dispersed. He doesn't show up just sort of willy-nilly. He'll show up in certain places, and the apostles will show up and say, oh, he beat us here. <laughs> yeah, he beat them there, but not the Word, because the Word had gotten there from the mouth of someone who was there on Pentecost, and they didn't have all the details and everything in, 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 clarified. So in other words, to, to, sorry, to flesh out the all flesh phrase, I, I think what's going on here is um, Joel is, Joel and then Peter and quoting Joel is saying, the, 
this Holy Spirit is going to spread to all people through the preaching of the word. That it's not just going to be given to everyone and now we kind of have to access it somehow inside of us, but rather that the Spirit comes with the preaching of the word. Um, and we get this sort of thing from Romans 10, faith comes through hearing. And you, and it, you cannot talk about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit apart from Christ. Um, and so if someone has no Jesus, they don't know Christ, then they don't have the Holy Spirit. Because you, you just you can't have one without the other. And in fact, this is the apostles show up and they say, well, were you baptized? Have you heard about the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, we were just baptized with John's baptism. And they say, oh, well, we got such a mess to clean up. But I just love that, right? Because the Spirit's just making this mess and the apostles have to teach. And it's just great. Um, but so they rebaptized them because they weren't baptized in the triune name. There was no Holy Spirit involved. They didn't know about it. So um, those things, the Spirit and the Word are always at work together throughout the texts. They just are. Okay, Tom and then Marjorie. Good, Tom. Well, the, the, the pouring out of the Spirit on all people, um, I always read as an indication that the Word wasn't going to come through some formalized um, through the Levitical priesthood or something like that. It was going to come through all people. Yeah, r right. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that's what it says later on, that like your, your sons and your daughters. Like, uh, and everybody. Yeah, everyone's going to be chatty uh, with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, very good. Yeah, excellent. I, I think that's I think that's the best explanation. Go ahead. I was just going to say that what you were saying about how to interpret that to me makes sense because if you read why that's written here, it's because Peter was trying to explain to the crowd that the men weren't drunk, weren't drunk. Yeah. that this is the fulfilling of the promise. It's actually happening in front of your eyes. Yeah, very good. That's very good. I, I don't think we have enough laughter about that verse, quite frankly. That's a really funny verse in the Bible. It, the, Peter's, I mean, he's almost joking. It's nine in the morning. How could they be drunk? Like, that's a funny line, and no one ever laughs in church. I just don't get it. Uh, it's actually a very funny verse. Okay, you can laugh, but the Bible has jokes in it. Um, it has a sense of humor. All right, so, um, huh, wow. Justification, Holy Spirit, good heavens, where are we? Okay, uh, chapter 11. No, no, don't be sorry. I, no, no, in fact, that's great, because that's follow-up from last week when we had to cut out, so I'm really glad we did that, and it reminds me that I was supposed to look up sanctification stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah uh, Dave, uh-huh. They refrain from eating and drinking until, until 10 a.m. or noon. So they were drinking by 10 o'clock. So, so it had to be 9 o'clock reference. It's 10 o'clock somewhere. That's awesome. Awesome. That's terrific. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.